Well, you've got a condition called myasthenia gravis, which I appreciate is probably a condition you've never ever heard of before. It's a rare condition. Uh, it probably affects only about one person in every 10,000 of the population. The name myasthenia means muscle weakness. And the name gravis is used because in some people it can be very severe. Now the name was first used um, many decades ago before we understood the nature of the disease. And I'm pleased to say that nowadays treatment is very effective and it's very unusual for patients to have severe forms of the disease. Or rather if they do have severe forms of the disease we can treat it and make them better. And the good news about this condition is that although it's probably going to be with you for life, we can treat it very effectively. And we would hope and expect to get you either back to normal or back to near normal. And hopefully it's not going to interfere greatly with your lifestyle. The downside is that you're likely to need treatment forever and the treatments that we use can cause side effects. And they're very variable. Some patients have more problems than others. But for the majority of people, the side effects are tolerable and the relief of the symptoms is excellent. It can affect anybody. It doesn't respect age, doesn't respect colour, doesn't respect sex. There are some slight oddities about it. Um, we know that younger people tend to be female and that in the older population males are more frequently affected. And around the world there are some slight variations. So for example, rather curiously in the Far East, patients tend to have more problems with the eye muscles than with the muscles in the arms and the legs. Why that should be, we're not entirely certain, but probably has something to do with the different genetic makeup of people in the Far East. It's a disease that affects the muscles, and it affects specifically the muscles that we call the skeletal muscles or the voluntary muscles. And these are the muscles that we have control over. So the muscles of the face, the muscles of the eyes, the muscles of the arms, the muscles of the chest, the breathing muscles. It doesn't affect other muscles in the body, such as the heart muscle, and it doesn't affect the smooth muscle. That's the muscle in the bowel and in the bladder. So those aren't affected at all, but it affects all the other muscles in the body. Very commonly, you get drooping of the eyelids. And frequently, uh, looking at the patient, it looks as if they're falling asleep. The other muscles that are involved are the muscles that move the eyes. And what happens then is, if a muscle is slightly weak, the eyes don't point in quite the same direction. And the result of that is double vision. So very common early symptoms of the condition are drooping of the eyelids and double vision. And one of the very characteristic features about myasthenia is that the weakness varies. It varies from day to day, and rather characteristically, it varies during the course of the day. And so a very common story is that people feel fine when they first get up in the morning, but as the day goes on, as they get more tired, they start to notice drooping of the eyelids, and they start to notice, they start to notice double vision. And for example, if they read for a prolonged period of time, uh, that tires the eyes, and they get double vision. In about 10% of people with myasthenia, the disease never spreads any further than that. It stays confined to the eyes, and we call that ocular myasthenia. But in the majority of patients, the weakness eventually spreads to other muscles. After the eyes, the next muscles that tend to be involved are the muscles in the mouth and in the throat. And that causes problems with speech and problems with swallowing. And again, like the eyes, this is fatigable, it is variable. And so rather commonly, patients will say that if they talk for a long time, their speech becomes more slurred. When they're eating, they may have trouble swallowing the food, they may choke on the food, and if the weakness is very severe, when they try and have a drink, the fluid may come back through the nose because of the weakness of the muscles at the back of the throat. The muscles in the arms and the legs can be involved, and it tends to be the muscles around the shoulders and the hips, and also the muscles in the hands. In a small proportion of people, the breathing muscles are also involved, usually only when the rest of the muscles are involved severely. But that is potentially very dangerous, and in a small proportion of people, the breathing becomes so impaired that for a period of time, assisted ventilation is required. But again, I'll emphasize the good news that with treatment, this weakness will improve. The cause of the weakness is actually very complicated, but it's important that you understand what is happening because it tells you how the treatments work and it also tells you how we go about making the diagnosis. If you want to move a muscle, for example, in the arm, the message to do so comes from the brain. 
So the message starts in the brain and it travels as an electrical signal down the nerves in the brain, down the spinal cord, down the nerves to the arm, and then onto the muscle. And the muscle contracts in response to the electrical signal from the nerve. The muscle itself contracts because of an electrical signal in the muscle. So the whole process is electrical. The problem is, is that there is a gap between the nerve and the muscle. And the electrical signal coming down the nerve can't jump that gap to the muscle. And what happens at the nerve-muscle junction, the neuromuscular junction, is fundamental to our understanding of what's happening in myasthenia. When the electrical signal reaches the end of the nerve, it causes the nerve to release a chemical called acetylcholine. And the acetylcholine diffuses across the gap and binds onto these special proteins called the acetylcholine receptor. And when the acetylcholine binds onto the receptor, it triggers off an electrical signal in the muscle, which leads to the muscle contracting. When you want to relax the muscle, the message stops coming down the nerve, no more acetylcholine is released, and the system resets itself. Now one very important point here is that the acetylcholine, if it stayed sitting in the gap, in the junction, the muscle would continue to contract, but you want it to relax. So you've got to get rid of the acetylcholine. And there is a special enzyme called cholinesterase, which destroys the acetylcholine. And the importance of that will become evident in a minute when we talk about the diagnosis and the treatment of the condition. So just summarising that, the message from the brain reaches the end of the nerve terminal, releases the acetylcholine, which crosses the gap, that stimulates the receptors, which sets off the electrical signal in the muscle, which makes it contract. And the acetylcholine is destroyed by the cholinesterase. Very, very complicated, but the whole process takes place in a fraction of a second. So there's an imperceptible delay between wanting to move the muscle and the muscle actually moving. Myasthenia gravis is what is called an autoimmune disease. And in autoimmune diseases, the body's immune system becomes confused and it produces antibodies that destroy or damage part of itself, hence the name autoimmune. In myasthenia, the antibodies interfere with the normal function of the neuromuscular junction. Now, in most patients, the antibody is a specific antibody which damages the acetylcholine receptor, which we've seen on the diagram. But we know that not every patient with myasthenia has those antibodies, although we have very good evidence, and we've had it for many years, that other antibodies are probably involved. Indeed, in the last couple of years, we've recognised a new antibody called the anti-musk antibody, which stands for muscle-specific kinase. It's a protein that is very closely related to the acetylcholine receptor, but is separate from it. So in some patients, there are anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, in some patients there are anti-musk antibodies, and in other patients we don't yet know which antibody is responsible, but we strongly suspect that there are antibodies directed against other proteins at the neuromuscular junction. But the fundamental problem in all of these situations is damage to the normal nerve muscle transmission mechanism. A very obvious question and I have to admit, it is the one question that we certainly don't have an answer to yet. We have a number of clues, but we do not know what triggers off the abnormal immune response. The immune system develops in childhood. And in early life, a gland in the chest called the thymus gland is very important in developing the immune system. It also helps develop what is called immune tolerance, so that the immune system doesn't recognise parts of the of the body as being foreign. And the purpose of the immune system is to recognise foreign invaders. And the most obvious everyday example of that is if you get an infection. If you get a chest infection, the immune system produces antibodies which try and destroy the bacteria causing the infection.